The land question remains one of the most emotive, divisive and unresolved issues of post-democratic South Africa. 30 years ago, the state committed to transfer at least 30% of the country's 86 million hectares of arable farmland to black people by 1999. The goalposts kept shifting. But how does that picture look on 30 years from now? Welcome to Democracy 30. My name is Oliver Dixon. It's an absolute honor and pleasure being in your company this evening. Has South Africa demonstrated the political will to address the land question in the past 30 years. Joining us for this discussion, Abu Lelwa Mabasa, the head of land reform in dispute resolution at Vatican's attorneys, also a member of the presidential advisory panel on land reform. Annalise Crosby, the head of legal intelligence at the Agricultural Business Chamber, and Andrew Apane from the African Farmers Association of South Africa. But first, let's watch this insert for context, produced by our producer, Nadia Dambuza. Let I put it quite frankly, if anybody thinks in South Africa that you can take the land without compensation, you're living in a dream. Let me put it quite frankly to you, if you want to start a civil war in South Africa, do that. Land reform has moved at snail's pace in South Africa, where the struggle for liberation was also to reverse the 1913 Natives Land Act's disposition and forced removals suffered by indigenous communities through many years of colonialism. This land belongs to the African majority in South Africa. These whites found us here and none of them came with a bag full of land. That's why they can't claim to be owning the land here in South Africa. Over the years, the state introduced programs to help marginalized groups acquire, own or manage land. While some required contributions from beneficiaries along with the state grants, others involved state-acquired land leases to beneficiaries with the intention to eventually transfer. But many of them failed due to lack of finances, while others became mired in corruption and other scandals. Among the important tasks of this new parliament is to finalize the constitutional amendments to clearly indicate how expropriation of land without compensation will be put into effect. To date, the Department of Land Reform and Rural Development says the state's land restitution program has settled just over 83,000 land claims, including land restoration and financial compensation, and 3 million hectares of land was restored to beneficiaries at a cost of $26.4 billion, with an additional $26 billion used for financial compensation. Experts have questioned the substance of these land transfers with concerns about the high failure rate of redistributed farms and excessive focus on farmland when the majority of people remain landless, especially in urban centers where economic opportunities are found. To date, over 4 million people are said to be living in informal settlements, with the number expected to rise. At this rate, there's no telling when will ownership patterns substantially change and whether equity will ever be achieved. Nadia Dambuza, Democracy 30. The hotbed that holds the heartbeat of South African economic development is the land question. But how have we fought so, for, so far in democratic South Africa? Let me start the conversation. Brillo, thank you so much for joining us. I want Pleasure. to start with you. You know the numbers. You advised the president on this. Mm. How much of South Africa's arable farmland is truly, substantively mm. in the hands of black farmers and remain commercially viable? That's an important question, um, Oliver. And I think the, the, the short answer to that is no one knows. The reason no one knows is, is as follows. 80% of South Africans actually live without um, any secure tenure. What do I mean by that? They... It, they exist in an informal land system where, for example, you find um, people that don't have title deeds, people don't have um, lease agreements that are written down, people don't have um, your, your, your rights of ways or, or any of those formally legally recognized um, secure tenure documents. So what you, have in, you know, what you have left with is that you have to go through the deeds system and when you go through the deed system it, it already excludes so many people that dwell in this informal sector so then what you're left with is people that um, have land that is mortgaged 
Um, and that's a very, very, very small minority um, of black people, especially um, when you speak to um, agriculture. And number two, South Africa, we don't have a system where individuals or even uh, trusts or companies that own land are actually uh, obliged to say what race they are. Yeah. So we don't have a system that is reliable that tells us that from plot A to B, it, it, it's, it's owned by Oliver Dixon and Oliver is an African male or, or anything like that. So we still have not done a lot of what we need to do in terms of surveying the land. If you think about the TBVC states, most of those pieces of land, as you know, that was in outside of South Africa, mm. most of those pieces of land are not surveyed. Um, they don't have addresses. So we first need to deal with this informal um, sector why of land. Have, why have we not done a comprehensive uh, audit of land? The, I think the, 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 the real answer to that is political will. But I want to say political will, you can only gauge it by one thing. Mm. Whether or not you've allocated enough resources in terms of funds and in terms of skills to do that. So the retort... Is it expensive and complex? Yes, it is. Um, the retort has been that it, it's going to be too expensive and complex. But my um, counter argument to that is it's expensive in the, in the short term, but it's required in the long term. Because at the end of the day, the cost at which you're going to pay, if you're not going to do it, is going to lead to anarchy. Yeah. Annalise, uh, perhaps to come to you here, the, the various models through which land restitution, land reform um, has been approached in South Africa um, has changed over time. We first had uh, the willing buyer, willing, buyer, willing uh, seller model. Uh, we then had a conversation about land expropriation without compensation, albeit part of the constitution does allow the state to expropriate land without compensation. Uh, that, of course, is incredibly complex, laborious uh, and tenuous. When we had the willing buyer, willing seller model, how much of the land that was held in the hands of uh, white farmers eventually made its way into the hands of black farmers and black communities? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I agree with Bulela that there are still a, a large number of um, sort of gray areas, but my colleague Wandile Shishlobo and um, Prof. Johan Kirsten has done a lot of work on this. Um, and, and they got to a figure of around 24% of land having been transferred, if you include everything, the financial compensation, the land that's been uh, purchased privately and through government programs and all of that. Yeah. Um, but yes, indeed, we, we have been trying all sorts of things. And I think political will, you know, one needs to, to define that. And, and I agree with Bulewa that at, at the end of the day, probably, um, it comes down to resources, but you also need to look at the, the constitutional and the legislative framework. So I, I think in terms of legislation and policy, we've, we've done relatively well as a country. We have um, lots of policies. We have laws for all the three different um, programs that, that the constitution mandates. Um, redistribution, restitution, as well as tenure reform. Um, but the, 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 where we've run into problems is with the implementation of these policies and laws and the lack of resources and, and skills to do that. Now, there's been various programs, especially in, in redistribution. They, they all have these abbreviations. So uh, there's been mm. the um, in initially the so-called slag program where families just got 15 or 16,000 households and they had to pull their money together. That was very little money even back in the in the 90s um, to buy farms. And it was basically unsustainable for so, for so many families to try and, um, you know, make a living from, from a farm that they've bought together in that way. And then we had the land redistribution and agricultural development, so-called LRAT, oh, um, which was more successful where there was sort of sliding, a sliding scale where people get, could get more um, state resources. Um, and then we had PLAS, the proactive land um, acquisition strategy the problem with PLAS was that mostly people did not get titles, so it was leases, and very often those le leases were not even in writing, so there was mm. a lot of uncertainty mm. with that. And then we, um, you know, we had the whole debate about expropriation without compensation and the attempt to amend the constitution, which eventually was was not successful. Um, but but it comes down to implementation and to the resources yeah. to do that implementation 
effectively. That really is the bottom line. Yeah. Andrew, before I come yeah. to you, Blair, you seem to disagree that we don't have enough legislative reforms and yeah. legislative tools yeah. uh, to change the picture. Yes. In fact, I want to comment around the issue around redistribution. Section 25 um, of the Constitution says that the state must take legislative and other measures to ensure that people have access to land. So, have they not um, done so? No. What we have are internal policies of the department, like um, Anne has just uh, uh, highlighted. But the Constitution envisages an act of parliament in, in, right. in a form of a redistribution act, which is going to be transparent and tell us all who must get what land, where, and for what reason. So yeah. it, it has to go through that parliamentary rigorous process. Not um, The internal policies are simply not good enough. Have we seen, uh, uh, Andrew, I want to bring you in here, the Land Claims Court has been marred with controversy over the last 30 years. A lot of uh, farmers, or at least a lot of tribal and communal land, had been restored through that, and we've seen communities attempting to farm, albeit subsistence at some uh, small scale, and attempt to go commercial at some point. Has the Land Claims Court been a, 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 a useful tool and avenue uh, for land reform, redistribution, and restitution? I think it's not to to the point that as farmers would like to see it happening. Uh, but the challenge that we have in this is the resources. The resources are challenges in, in this uh, land reform in, in our country. And our problem there as well that really frustrates us as farmers is, you see, uh, when you do, for example, LRAT. LRAT is talking about the, the leases and all that. But the people, you'll find that farmers, they got lease, but they don't have lists that are registered. The 30 years lists are not registered with the deeds. So it becomes a problem as well to farmers. Why is that a problem? Because they can't access Risk. finance for them to be able to function. So if you look at the revenue contribution of farms before they were procured and the revenue contributions after, it's totally different. Actually, it goes down because there's not any financial input that helps farmers to make sure that they operate um, effectively. Do you have a sense of how much we've spent as the state on land reform specifically for black farmers? Sure, not really, but my, our, our concerns in, in, in that is, for example, one of the issues that held the government back, they can spend more money on it, but the problem is, after spending so much money, what happens with after support? Mm. Pre, because, you know, buying a farm is not a problem. But if you buy a farm and that farm lie fallow, that is a problem because now there are two things that we are going. Food security get uh, uh, at risk. Number two is unemployment as well from those farms come up again. Because remember, prior the farms would be bought, there were employees there and the food security was guaranteed. So we really need to look at funding after uh, procurement of those farms. Yeah. Uh, there are a number of issues around funding that I do want us to double click in on, specifically mm. when we look at black emerging farmers yeah. uh, in the last 30 years. But we're going to take a break. On the other side of this, we continue the conversation. Don't go away. Welcome back to Democracy 30. Tonight we ask the question, does South Africa have the political will to change the land reform project of the last 30 years? And has enough land been transferred into the hands of black people since 1994? Uh, before we went to the break, Andrew, you, yeah. you were talking there about commercial support uh, for, for, for black farmers, saying that because they don't have a registered uh, uh, ownership or registered deed to yeah. the land, it's yeah. difficult to access financing. Uh, but it seems difficult even when they do have that. What are some of the other obstacles when it comes to uh, the commercial support for black farmers in South Africa? I mean, if you look at, the, for example, the fund like uh, CASP and ILIMA and all those funds, I don't think there's sufficient uh, budget that goes into those budget to make sure that uh, our farmers get fully funded to be operational. And one of the challenges that we have as well in our country is uh, there is no exit strategy of farmers to be exiting from, from a grant into maybe a blended funding. Because remember, you need to really prepare this farmer that uh, he must graduate from a grant perspective and move into blended funding, which is portion of grant and loan, and also prepare them from there so that they can move into, into uh, a loan funding. Mm -hmm. But though I don't think the plans and the will is there from government. 
you look, they do little pieces, little support, and those little support that they give to our farmers are really not making any differences. That's why our farmers are not really performing mm. at, the, at the efficiency that they should be. Uh, Annalise, is the land bank sufficiently cap uh, capitalized and does it have uh, the right sort of risk model uh, that it can apply to black farmers, black emerging farmers in particular? Yeah, so I, I don't really want to speak for land bank, but I mean, you, you, you asked, um, you know, how much land has been spent um, on, on land reform and the research indicates that it's only a percent, one, about 1% 1 on average of the, the budget of the country that gets allocated to land reform. And, you know, land bank and everybody else in, in government that's involved in land reform, you know, must then draw their, their funds from that. So that's, that's very little, actually. Mm. Um, we do have the blended finance scheme now, which holds some hope, I think, of improving the situation because I agree with, with Andrew, you know, up to date, the, the support has not um, been nearly um, sufficient. Um, but hopefully as we move forward, Land Bank is working with the IDC already on this blended finance scheme and they are now drawing in um, some of the um, banks as well. So hopefully that will um, help improve the, the funding situation. Mm. But anyway, the land question in South Africa is not just a farming and commercial question. Mm. It's also an identity question. And that's why it's such a difficult uh, question to resolve, particularly yeah. given the ethno-demographic uh, complexities of the last 30 years, of the last 100 years, effectively, yeah. since 1913. Yes. Um, that element of the land question also then becomes contentious with uh, against the commercial question because sometimes mm. we look at mines, we look at uh, oil and gas mm. exploration companies, mm. we look at private developers who want to access land that compete against the interests of mm. communal and tribal land. Mm. That also becomes complex. How have we uh, <clears throat> fared, uh, fared so far in, 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 in that question over the last 30 yeah. years? I think that's important to talk about the, the nuances and the, and the different contentions. The first is that the land question is also not just about farmland, right? We know that the world over, um, over 60% of the world population is moving to urban areas and that there's far more need for um, land that can be occupied for urban uh, um, 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 purposes. But also, as you correctly point out, where does this leave communities? Because on one hand, we have land that is being developed, for example, for renewable energies that's happening on the formal, um, on the uh, formerly TBVC states with communities. Where are communities in that conversation around uh, renewable energy? Where are communities around mines de um, decarbonizing? But I think the point that I'd like to drive home is that we don't have a philosophical um, kind of conclusion or settlement around when we talk about black people, they're also not a homogenous group, right? Mm. So on one hand, we're talking about um, emerging, uh, you know, black farmers that must now become uh, part of producers of food security. But on the other hand, we know that the constitution has a, a very strong pro-poor element. So are we trying to get uh, black farmers to graduate, um, say mm. from small farmers into, into, into the large economy, mm. Or are we trying to get people out of poverty and to kind of have like this pro-poor approach where poor people um, that are, do live in the outskirts can also feel the sense of identity and this uh, sense of belonging? So I think it would be important um, for South Africa to kind of move the needle and move the debate, um, not just about, you know, statistics or um, whether or not it's 24% of, of black people that have land is, is, not, is not important. It's not important when land is going to finally be in, in black hands. What's important is that understanding that the land reform question doesn't have an end date. Mm. It is mm. going to be with us eternally and we shouldn't be so concerned about kind of putting a, a, a stop date at it. Um, but also I think mo most importantly, it needs to be th that very same thing that f is, is centered right in the middle of the economy as a thing that can um, propel our economy. Because I think right now, the land reform question is in the periphery um, in favor of, you know, um, there's, there's energy issues and so forth. It kind of always moves further and further away um, from the center of conversations. We only heard a lot about it in 2018 when there was a constitutional amendment that failed. Um, and it kind of moves 
in and out of our conversations depending on when elections happen. But it should actually yeah. be the one thing that is centered around yeah. all our conversations um, at, 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 at all the time. Annalise, Annalise, I want to bring you back in here because you had spoken earlier about uh, the land expropriation without compensation model uh, being one that is fleeting, it comes and it goes. Um, and Bulelo was right, it's one that's going to stay with us for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Political parties uh, ac across the political spectrum uh, seem to find favor in, in, in that as a policy. But the retort has often been that, well, uh, investment is going to leave the country, uh, it's mm -hmm. going to plunge us into a food security crisis. Uh, have we worked past that? Look, um, expropriation does have its place, but expropriation in itself will definitely not solve the land reform um, crisis, mm. and expropriation without compensation will have lots of negative unintended, uh, unintended cons consequences, that, that is for sure. So, you know, if you go back to that um, Halima Mutlante report, the um, high panel, um, high level panel report, um, which had 200 pages on land reform, which I think is still one of the most uh, authoritative reports on land reform that we've had in this country. It, that spelled out very clearly that the problem is not the constitution. The problem is um, not accessing land. It's, it is about the lack of implementation that we've had of the policies and programs and properly resourcing those. Yeah. So, you know, we, we really need to not focus just on one thing. We've, we need to focus on the whole spectrum because like yeah. Leilua said, it, it's, we have everything from, you know, people on the peri-urban areas and the urban areas to big commercial farming. And you cannot just have a one size fits all instrument for everything. You need to have focus in your programs. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, is, is expropriation without compensation the panacea to our land question problem? I, I think there's no political will in that. That's, that's my, my personal view. Because in, it was in hype, then uh, it just falls uh, to, off. To, to, Annalise, falls off. to Annalise's earlier point, yeah. how do we define political will when it comes to this? Mm. It's putting resources to the initiatives and as well as legislating and making sure that it becomes a, a, it sees a day. But if, it doesn't, if there's no political will, because of insecurities that it's not going to see any day. But just, just differentiating apart from that, you see the problem that we also have here is we are having a lot of lands. I mean, she was talking about the land that we, only do not, we don't only need land for, for farming. But if you look at, for example, in the villages, those lands that were allocated, for example, in the Bantu's land, those are not arable land. And we are trying to utilize the land that is not meant to do farming, to do farming. And those are one of the things that makes most of the black people fail in that, especially the one that are having the PTOs in the villages. So yeah. it's, a, it's a big challenge. Mm -hmm. So our, our, our point as Afasa is we really need to make sure that the land that is there, uh, that goes into black hands, it should be a productive land. That's very, very How do you determine that? Because productivity is not just farming. Productivity can be real estate development, which mm. is, is, is a viable uh, option, and black people aren't a, uh, a dominant player in that space. Yes, I do agree with that. But looking at the, at, the, at, the, at the farming side, what we want to say there is productivity from a side must be determined by the revenue contribution per hectare of that land. Right. So that's where we come from. So, I mean, you can get a farm that is about 10 hectares, but the revenue is high and can sustain. Mm. And you get a farm that is 1,000 hectares, but it really doesn't make any impact into the, the contribution of the economy. Yeah. Or, you know. So those are the things that we want our government to, to look at that. Even when they procure land, we want to say that. Let's look at what facets of land or parcels of land sure. are productive, but based on the turnover of those farms, okay. not only hectares. Yeah. The last question is for you, Bulelo, and I, I unfairly kept it for you towards the end of this conversation <laughs> uh, because you sat on the President's Advisory Council. Yeah. Are land reform instruments like the Ingonyama Trust an impediment to land reform in South Africa? Absolutely not. Um, Ingonyama Trust land, I think, constitutes about less than 20% of land in South Africa. It is already land that is in the hands um, of black people. The Peter Meritzburg High Court already opined on this, that the, the difficulty was that the um, insistence of the Ingo Trust 
on uh, living, um, um, what do you call it, lease, um, leases, or yeah, or, yeah um, that was unlawful. So, so the, the, the illegality comes in democratizing the Ingonyama Trust uh, Board in, to, to ensure that it, it obviously complies with... Have they done um, that since the judgment? Look, um, I'm not sure about that because I know that the minister, the erstwhile minister, took the, the judgment on appeal. Um, but what is clear to, to, to everyone now is that the, the Ingonyama Trust issue presents an opportunity to ensure yeah. that women are not discriminated mm. and that poor people aren't um, made to pay um, you know, amounts of money that are not governed or regulated. Absolutely. But insofar as the Ingonyama Trust land it, that is concerned, it, it's, it's already in, in, in black hands. Yeah. And, and I don't sure. believe that it's the the reason why land reform um, is not working. Yeah, mm. Brelo Mabasa, thank you so much for your thank time. You. I appreciate it. Annalise, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Your insights have been incredibly valuable here on the program. Thank and that you. brings us to the end of this week's installment of Democracy 30. It f always feels like we never have enough time. Of course, the conversation continues. You can find me on social media on exit is at Oliver underscore speaking and on Facebook is simply Oliver Dixon. Let me know what your thoughts are on tonight's conversation. But for myself and the team, it's good night for now. Cheers.